All right, it looks like we've got 40 people or so um, that are on the webinar. So I think it's time to go ahead and uh, have our presentation of the annual psychiatry teaching awards. This is always a, uh, a high point of the year, being able to celebrate some of our dedicated educators, um, teachers, mentors um, that work with um, the, the whole span of trainees that we have within the Department of Psychiatry. So it is my honor to present them, and I will be up. So reading um, some of the rave reviews that we got about them uh, from their, usually from their students, um, but also sometimes from their colleagues. So the first award is to the outstanding faculty house staff teaching among people in the adult or geriatric division. And this year it goes to Erica Sue. Erica, can you appear? All right, there she is. All right. So a medical student were, wrote about Dr. Sue. Um, As a student fresh out of my preclinical studies, I initially struggled to translate the subjectivity of the human mind into the objective findings of the mental status exam. When I expressed my frustration to Dr. Sue and the team, the very next day, she had printed out a vocabulary sheet of words we could use to describe our MSc findings. She explained how we could apply that vocabulary in the context of our patient list, and she tasked us with using at least three of those words every time we presented patients. It was a simple exercise, but very effective at building and reinforcing our tools for assessing psychiatric patients. A colleague writes of working um, with Dr. Sue in the psychodynamic psychotherapy concentration that Dr. Sue has shown herself to be an outstanding teacher. She's the primary co-teacher for the PGY3 curriculum, leading a three hour weekly learning session for five PGY3 residents with didactics, review of readings, experiential learning that includes meditation and therapy skills building and facilitated group review of patient session videos from residents and faculty. This is no small task as the residents just learning psychotherapy for the first time, bring their doubts, discomforts and disagreements into the learning process. Dr. Sue and her co-teacher did quite a bit of heavy lifting each week, managing the group process, keeping the discussion productive, regulating emotional distress among the residents, and outlining and highlighting lighting the key takeaways from the reading. So Dr. Sue, thank you so much for your outstanding work with our learners. All right, yeah, th this would be when we'd have applause, but we don't really do that. So, okay, I will thank you and excuse you then. Thank you. So the next person uh, and the next award is for outstanding resident or fellow teaching. Uh, and this is actually, it's outstanding resident fellow or psychology trainee um, teaching. And we had a lot of um, uh, nominations um, for this. Um, and I am excited to announce that the winner is Dr. Aaron Lula. MD, PhD, a second year psychiatry resident at the UCLA VA Greater Los Angeles program. A medical student writes about Dr. Lula. He's, it's been a joy, a joy to learn and work with him. We could tell whenever he held his teaching sessions that he cared on a deep level about our experiences on our rotation at the VA. He consistently asked us how he could improve his small group didactics and whether we had any issues on consults or wards that he could help with. When it came to direct clinical teaching, Aaron made sure that the information he was bestowing upon us was translated in a digestible way so that we as medical students could absorb it and put it into practice. During my psychiatry clerkship at the West LA VA, 
Dr. Lula went far above any other resident that I've worked with to create a deeply tailored, thoughtful, and educational learning environment. More than any other mentor, I owe him for my certainty and my decision to pursue research track psychiatry residency. Another writes, Aaron Lilla is a fantastic student educator. He has on his own initiative, created a medical student teaching curriculum and has been piloting it with the UCLA medical students rotating at the VA. He created shelf exam geared PowerPoint presentations with questions, videos, and content review that he goes over with students on a weekly basis. But it, not only the medical students admire him, a, a fellow resident writes, in addition to his intentional efforts to promote learning, Dr. Lula has exemplified patience, compassion, and positivity in the clinical setting. He serves as a role model in interdisciplinary professional relationships. I appreciated seeing him liaison with social work, nursing, therapists, and other colleagues, all in a profoundly patient-centered way. By fostering a collegial atmosphere and genuine team spirit, he seamlessly advanced patient care and helped other trainees do the same. So, Thank you for all of your work um, now and in the future, Dr. Villa. All right. The next um, award goes to our outstanding community educator. This is a fairly new um, award, uh, and but we we have had fabulous nominees uh, nonetheless. And this year's recipient is Dr. Hallie Scott, who is a museum educator and specialist for university audiences at the Hammer Museum. Uh, and um, it really was a delight reading about the kind of educational opportunities that Dr. Scott has provided for um, our trainees. A current resident wrote, during my internship year, Halle co-led a discussion about structural inequity using artwork as a catalyst for conversation. We discussed what pieces meant to us and what we saw, and it was amazing to see how she facilitated conversations about race, gender, class, and inequity. My favorite part of the orientation was discussing Mark Bradford's Rebuild South Central a mixed media piece where the artist layered material he kept from the Rodney King uprisings. We talked about police brutality, gentrification, and past and present uprisings. That session and the session we had during my second year both made me think about how we could reflect and reimagine using art and made me more excited to work in community settings in Los Angeles. An alumni resident writes, Dr. Scott is a courageous educator and an invaluable community partner. She's exceedingly de deserving of this award for her commitment to supporting burgeoning UCLA psychiatrists to grapple with structural determinants of health through conversations about art. A current faculty member wrote, I've known Ms. Dr. Scott since uh, 2019, when our psychiatry residency program first partnered with the Hammer Museum on an educational event. Since that time, I've been continually inspired by her dedication to teaching our psychiatry residents and the level of ingenuity and innovation she brings to each and every class. Dr. Scott has left a deep impression on our residents and our program, particularly in her teaching on topics of implicit bias, social justice, and criminal justice systems. Dr. Scott, thank you so much for all that you do and are doing for our residents. Okay, so I will move on now to um, the other outstanding um, um, faculty house staff teaching award, this time from the Child and Adolescent and Population Behavioral Health Division, although Dr. Walsh um, very much um, spans um, uh, all of the aspects of our department. Dr. Walsh is um, the Director of Internship um, and Director of Medical Assessment 
but also is the director of the Neurobehavioral Epilepsy Program, uh, and um, which is relevant as the one of the notes is Dr. Walshaw stands out not just because she's one of the few psychologists who can be seen wearing scrubs and a white coat in our hallways, as she zips between the hospital and Semmel in her shifting roles, but also because she is welcoming and inclusive, making everyone feel that they are an important, important part of the team, division, and university. Many of my own trainees who have had the privilege of learning from her have commented on Dr. Walsh's brilliance and use of support and scaffolding provided under her supervision to enhance their learning experiences in her many clinics. <laughs> um, a faculty member mentions, people told me that as teachers, you have to meet your trainees where they're at. I never really understood what this meant until I saw Dr. Walshaw engage with trainees. She's compassionate, patient, and encouraging. She is respectful and sensitive to the diversity of the trainees and our patients. Above all, she has consistently shown an unwavering commitment to teaching others and providing high quality patient-centered care. Thank you so much, Dr. Walshaw, for all you do and all the, the continuing new things you keep doing. Thank you. Um, we are not joined today by Dr. Elizabeth Casagneño, but I wanted to recognize that she is the winner of this year's Voluntary Clinical Faculty Teaching Award as an exceptional physician teacher uh, at, in um, a variety of different places. Um, her remarkable strengths including, include her ability to smoothly integrate pharmacologic and psychotherapeutic interventions, making her a wonderful role model for our residents. Uh, she is also, she's able to provide knowledge and experience with selecting the right modality and when they should be integrated for um, spanning psychosis, depression, anxiety, and OCD. She's also able to adapt to the questions that trainees have, as well as their level of knowledge and skills. So, Dr. Casagneño, thank you so much for your um, tireless work as a voluntary clinical faculty member. So, next awardee is Dr. Emily Ricketts. Dr. Ricketts is the recipient of the Outstanding Research Mentor Award. And it's always interesting, this award, um, usually um, we get nominations for people who are very senior people who are mentoring um, uh, junior faculty. And we have people like Dr. Ricketts who are themselves still junior faculty who are mentoring all kinds of trainees uh, and uh, people junior to herself. Um, and uh, it, it is a joy to see both, a particular joy to see somebody like Dr. Riggins who is gonna hopefully keep going. Um, so a current faculty member states, in addition to her direct research mentorship, Dr. Ricketts also provides group and individual training and supervision in diagnostic and clinical outcome assessment to the graduate student externs, providing these services to not only her own research projects, but also to other faculty in our program. Her success as a research mentor goes beyond simple instruction in research methodologies. She has created a warm, supportive, honest, and open training environment and is always generous with her time and energy be it to address an issue, solve a problem, or celebrate a success. She's extremely dedicated to her mentees and highly knowledgeable, enthusiastic, and engaging as a teacher. A faculty member reflected, given how incredibly demanding Dr. Ricketts' multiple clinical and research responsibilities are, I've always been impressed by how unfailingly generous she is with her time when it comes to mentoring trainees interested in research. She is genuinely interested and committed to mentoring students at all levels of training, 
from undergraduate students exploring career paths to graduate students and postdoctoral fellows developing a field of expertise. A professor writes, Dr. Ricketts has a varied teaching portfolio, which includes training and supervision and clinical features and behavior therapy, um, such as habit reversal training, cognitive behavioral therapy, and exposure and response prevention for youth and young adults, all the way to, to clinical uh, psychology interns and psychiatry residents and to fellows. I've personally heard Dr. Ricketts give lectures to my class in circadian rhythms and found them to be thoughtful and well-organized. So a lot of details there about the kind of teaching and mentoring Dr. Ricketts has done and continues to do. Thank you so much. So the, the next um, teaching award, the last one I'm gonna present um, is um, for outstanding medical student teaching. And this is to Dr. John Lee. Um, it, it's a current resident states, I worked with Dr. Lee on the CL Psychiatry Service for several weeks and numerous times on call. He consistently provides stellar teaching to the residents and medical students, managing to find a perfect balance between education and efficiency. No mean task. His teaching is thorough, concise, and clear, and is always very clinically relevant. I specifically look forward to any opportunities I have to work with him, as I know I will be well supported and will have some of the best opportunities for learning that I will have during residency. A medical student notes, Dr. Lee has a unique ability to make complex psychiatric concepts understandable and relatable for medical students. He encourages students to think critically and ask questions while also providing guidance and support to help us understand the material fully. His teaching style is interactive and engaging, which keeps students actively involved in the learning process. Personally, the student goes on, personally, I owe much of my own success to Dr. Lee's outstanding mentorship, both in research and career advising. When I was, teaching, when I was seeking a research mentor in psychiatry last year, Dr. Lee both helped me find potential mentors and only and also kindly offered to serve as my research mentor. And Dr. Lee serves as a mentor um, for many of the medical students as he is one of the college chairs in the academic um, medicine or academic, uh, academic medicine uh, college um, within the School of Medicine. So thank you, Dr. Lee, for all that you have done and are continuing to do for our medical students. I am going to turn over the podium now to Dr. Martyr. Yes, hi. It's my pleasure to announce that uh, our own Dr. Marty Stuber is the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. And it's a pleasure to do this because Margie is my friend, colleague, and frequently an advisor. She's had an extraordinary career over more than 35 years uh, as an educator for both medical students and residents. She's worked in, in medical student education since she joined the faculty in 1987, where she's focused on systems of care interprofessional education and health behavior. For the past decade, she's directed the required longitudinal system-based healthcare interprofessional course for third-year medical students, third-year dental students, and second-year advanced practice nursing students. And more recently, uh, this also includes students from the School of Public Health. She's the career advisor for all of the DGSOM medical students who are considering or applying to psychiatry residencies. And I believe she has, uh, we should be grateful to her for all of the wonderful people, all of the medical students who've actually come into our own residency. Since, ninth, since 2018, she's been the program, residency program director 
for the UCLA VA Greater Los Angeles Psychiatry Residency. And she actually started that program uh, from its very beginning. And under her leadership, it's become an absolute outstanding psychiatry residency. And uh, I know that meant that she's much beloved among uh, the residents in that program. In addition, addition to these teaching roles, uh, Dr. Stuber is an active clinician. She's a child psychiatrist, works within the child division, and she also provides supervision in an interprofessional integrated care clinic for homeless veterans. She has many publications uh, and has credentials as, a, as an academic. A past medical student wrote that Dr. Stuber regularly met with that person and other medical students on a research team to help develop hypotheses and research methods, connected this individual to other faculty, and provided logistical support to ensure the project actually happened. Well, this person quotes, well, I can confidently say that these projects would not have happened without her guidance. She was simultaneously able to give me and the other medical students on the team autonomy to develop our own research interests and love for academic medicine. Since these research experience, this individual has gone on to become an inaugural resident in the UCLA Resident Scientist Training Program and has recently submitted their own K Award application. As this person says, I firmly believe that these early formative research experiences under Dr. Stuber's guidance and mentorship are a large reason why this person has enjoyed research success and chosen to pursue a career as a physician investigator. Another medical student wrote that Dr. Stuber's passion for interpersonal education and practice rubs off on those with whom she works. She's dedicated to training the future medical workforce and integrating students from other health professions through, through the process. Based on her sincere desire to provide a positive, rewarding, and well-rounded experience for students, faculty, staff, she's been just an extraordinary mentor. Marty, congratulations on your wonderful career as a psychiatry educator. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, this concludes our um, annual um, teaching award ceremony. Um, I'm grateful to those of you who had come early to be able to be a part of this. And I will now um, turn it over to Dr. Help um, as we prepare to go into the, the grand rounds. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Suber, and congratulations again to you and to all the other award recipients. Um, we're gonna yeah. um, we're gonna be starting our grand rounds in just a couple of minutes. Um, so hang tight. Um, we will be, yeah, you'll you'll hear the music and then we'll get started in another minute or two. All right, see you in, see you briefly. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, today, we are featuring head talks. Uh, we have three residents who are going to be presenting to us on topics that they find interesting, unique, or compelling in psychiatry and mental health. Um, the talks are limited to 12 minutes each, which will hopefully be enough to pique your interest um, in these topics and maybe even provoke you to want to go look into it more on your own and um, change how you view things in our field. Um, we're hoping that these talks will provoke some thoughts, so please feel free to ask questions at any time using the Q&A function, and we'll do a joint Q&A at the end after all three speakers have had a chance to speak. Um, so make sure um, when submitting your question to make a note of who your question is addressed to. And without further ado, I'd like to bring on our first speaker. Um, first, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Angie Radhakrishnan. Um, so Angie completed her medical studies at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia before coming here for residency. Since starting as a resident here, she has been just an absolute superstar. Um, I've had the um, honor to work with her on a few occasions in various settings, and I've just been very impressed both in terms of her clinical abilities as well as her um, breadth of interest in both geriatric psychiatry and medical education. Um, she was an inpatient chief resident this year and will be continuing this role for next year as well. And I'm happy to say that um, she'll be continuing on as a geriatric psychiatry fellow after completing her residency here, um, next year. 
Um, I'm sure that after she graduates, she'll continue to do great things and um, continue to contribute to our field. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Angie Radhakrishnan as she talks to us about CBT for insomnia. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Halt. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Anjita Radhakrishnan. I'm a third year psychiatry resident at UCLA, and today I'll be talking about CBT for insomnia. Uh, so just to start off, I don't have any disclosures. The learning objectives for my talk today will be, I hope that learners would be able to understand the importance of effective treatment of insomnia, be able to provide a brief overview of CBTI to patients, and to be able to recognize when to refer a patient to CBTI. First, we'll discuss the prevalence of insomnia. 10% of the population have insomnia disorder, and one in three has symptoms. But this topic is especially relevant for clinicians, including psychiatrists, because the majority of patients with a psychiatric disorder have symptoms of insomnia. In my outpatient clinical experience this year, I noticed a pattern where nearly all of my patients had either difficulty with sleep initiation, sleep maintenance, or early morning awakenings with difficulty returning to sleep all typical symptoms of insomnia. It goes without saying that disturbed sleep also has numerous negative impacts on other areas of life. Many patients would ask for a quick pharmacologic option. However, with time, I realized this contributed to increased side effects, a psychological sense of dependence on medications to fall asleep, and was a short-term solution at best. This led to my interest in CBTI as a long-lasting solution. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia uh, has a goal of addressing common thoughts and behaviors that interfere with optimal sleep. And this is done in just four to eight sessions. This graphic is adapted from the CBT triangle, showing the self-propagating cycle that maintains poor sleep, negative thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Interventions with cognitive and behavioral techniques are used to increase sleep duration, quality, and control of sleep pattern. So let's start with a case. We have a 34 year old man who presents with acute insomnia for the past three weeks after the death of his mother. He endorses significant anxiety around sleeplessness, interfering with his ability to work. Which interventions would be most useful? A, start a short-term BZRA, which stands for benzodiazepine receptor agonist, including benzos and Z drugs. B, start melatonin. C, refer for a sleep study or D, refer to CBTI. And I'll give everyone a few uh, seconds to think it over. So the correct answers here are both A and D. When there is a short-term insomnia, lasting less than a month, and a clear psychological cause or stressor in a patient with severe distress, including deterioration in daytime function or excessive anxiety regarding sleeplessness, then short-term use of a medication in combination with CBTI is reasonable. The medication would tend to be tapered over six to eight weeks, but the benefits from the CBTI will persist. What we know from literature is that 70 to 80% of patients with primary insomnia showed improvements. This includes less time to fall asleep, more time spent to sleep, and waking up less during sleep. And this is based off of 20 randomized controlled trials. We have less data for acute insomnia and subthreshold insomnia. However, it seems to point in the direction that CBTI is likely beneficial. As demonstrated in the last case, patients may know that CBTI benefits will take a few weeks and seek a pharmacologic solution. This is reasonable in certain circumstances um, with, where the clinical decision will be based on severity, but again, should be done in conjunction with CBTI. As for chronic insomnia lasting greater than three months, we have most of the studies uh, that are done. Meta-analyses show that medication um, do, medications do not enhance treatment effects, especially with the longer term studies over 12 to 24 months. Thus, the ACP recommendation is that CBTI is the first line treatment for chronic insomnia uh, and medication should only be considered as a second line adjunctive treatment if CBTI was unsuccessful. 
Now let's get into some of the specific principles that are taught in CBTI, as shown in this video from Sleep Foundation. For example, one common approach is called cognitive restructuring. This involves analyzing your thoughts so you don't create stress-inducing feedback loops. For example, after a restless night, you may think, I didn't sleep at all last night, which is only going to make you stressed and anxious about your sleep. Instead, cognitive restructuring will train you to think, I probably got more sleep than I realize, which will better help ease your mind. Another approach is called sleep restriction. People with insomnia often spend too much time lying in bed awake. Sleep restriction limits time spent in bed in order to reestablish a consistent sleep schedule. Sleep restriction begins by calculating the total time spent asleep using a sleep diary. Time in bed is then adjusted to reflect this amount plus 30 minutes. For example, if a person is trying to sleep eight hours a night but only getting five hours, they start by adjusting their bedtime to spend five hours plus 30 minutes in bed. Once a person spends the majority of their time in bed sleeping, they can begin gradually increasing their time in bed. Then there is stimulus control. Many people with insomnia begin to dread their bedroom, associating it with wakefulness and frustration. During treatment, the bed is only used for sleep and sex. Clients are instructed to get out of bed when it's difficult to fall asleep or when they lie awake for more than 10 minutes, only going back to bed when they are tired again. And here's an example of a sample course schedule that would last over at least six sessions. Uh, session one would start with psychoeducation, uh, talking about the sleep-wake cycle, what is REM sleep, the effect of aging on sleep, circadian rhythm, the 3P model of chronic insomnia, which is predisposing, precipitating, and perpetuating factors, and the treatment rationale. Similar to other forms of CBT, future sessions would include a review of the homework progress and troubleshooting any issues. Sleep hygiene is also a very important concept that would be discussed early on. This involves optimization of the comfort of the sleep environment, turning the lights off at night, having the bedroom at a cool temperature, avoiding screens, including both TVs and phones for at least one hour before bedtime, avoiding substances that interfere with sleep, especially coffee and alcohol, and avoiding naps to maximize the sleep drive. Stimulus control was discussed in the video based on the principle of classical conditioning uh, to ensure that the bed is associated with sleep. Sleep restriction involves keeping sleep logs and maintaining a strict sleep schedule. The relaxation component would be similar uh, to other forms of CBT as well uh, for depression or anxiety, in which uh, there would be progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness, meditation, and diaphragmatic breathing that is taught. Cognitive restructuring would target anxious and catastrophic thoughts associated with sleeplessness, inappropriate expectations about hours of sleep, and misattributions regarding the effects of sleeplessness. And finally, the last session would conclude with a wrap up and relapse prevention strategies. So let's do another case now. We have a 34 year old man who presents with chronic insomnia for the past three years. During the pandemic, his company shifted to work from home and he got into the habit of working from bed. Which CBTI principle would be most useful to review with him? A, stimulus control, B, cognitive restructuring, C, sleep hygiene, or D, relaxation techniques. So in this case, the answer is A, stimulus control, uh, to ensure that the bed is associated with sleep. Now that we've discussed the components of CBTI and its efficacy, let's move on to discuss who should be referred. The target population includes all ages, whether patients are taking medications for sleep or not, and across physical, mental, and reproductive health conditions as well. So CBTI is nearly universal. That being said, there are a few relative contraindications. These patient populations are generally uh, ones that, are, uh, that might have adverse effects when reducing sleep time in the short term while doing the sleep restriction component. For example, with, for a patient with untreated bipolar disorder, sleeplessness could precipitate a manic episode. 
Poorly controlled seizure disorder is another patient population. Patients who are already excessively sleepy during the day, as this can be exacerbated by the sleep restriction. Any acute change in health status, such as illness, accidents, or a surgery, and high-risk occupations, including long-haul driving or heavy machinery. Regardless, modifications can be made to the CBTI schedule or the sleep restriction component to adapt for this. So now let's move on to our final case. Here we have the 34-year-old man with a past medical history of recently diagnosed obesity and hypertension who presents with worsening insomnia for the past three months. He endorses excessive daytime sleepiness and difficulty with concentration. He takes a nap in the evening as he feels exhausted after returning home from work. His usual nighttime routine involves a few glasses of wine and falling asleep while watching TV. His partner complains that he snores loudly. Which interventions would be most useful at this time? A, start a BZRA, B, refer for a sleep study, C, start an antidepressant, or D, sleep hygiene. And again, I'll give everyone uh, 10 to 15 seconds to think about this one. So for this question, the correct answers would be both B and D. In any evaluation, we would of course consider medical causes for disrupted sleep. In this question stem, it's leading towards uh, an undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, presenting as daytime sleepiness, snoring, and difficulty concentrating. There are also symptoms that overlap with symptoms of depression. In this scenario, we would refer for a sleep study to treat the underlying cause, but I hope that this example illustrates how CBTI principles can be helpful regardless, even as a brief psychoeducation intervention, if not a full CBTI referral. So the takeaway is while considering medical and psychological causes and the duration of symptoms, clinicians should also consider CBTI. It is safe, low risk, efficient in that it's done in just four to eight weeks and will teach lifelong skills with a durable benefit unlike that from medications. For clinicians or patients who are interested in the next steps, there is a free CBTI coach app that has a virtual sleep diary, uh, assessments and educational materials. There are also some very thorough videos on YouTube and these are um, two uh, from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Anxiety and Depression Association of America that have uh, very thorough videos. And finally, if a patient is interested, um, then they can be referred to the UCLA Insomnia Clinic. And here are my references. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angie. Really appreciate that perspective on CBTI. All right, um, I'm gonna go over and transition to our second speaker for the day. Um, and that will be Dr. Kevin Kennedy. Um, I'm very honored to introduce uh, Kevin. Kevin went to medical school at the University of Chicago, um, where he showed a lot of promise as an educator um, with a specific focus on the area of evidence-based medicine. Here at UCLA, um, Kevin is very well regarded and respected for his clinical acumen, as well as his focus on applying the literature to our daily practice. Uh, Kevin will actually be serving in two chiefships next year. He will be one of the inpatient chiefs, um, as well as one of the curriculum chiefs. This year, I've been in clinic with Kevin um, on many of the Fridays, and he always challenges me to think about the evidence base underlying our treatment decisions and to make sure that we have a solid reason for doing what we're doing. Um, and in that same vein, today, Kevin will introduce the concept of medical reversal and its application to the field of psychiatry. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Kennedy. Thank you, Dr. Helt. So um, today I'll be talking about medical reversal in psychiatry. And I'll begin by saying that I have no disclosures. So this topic is about the ways in which medical practices change. And overall, I'll identify two different ways. The first is called replacement. And this is the idea that we like to tell ourselves about medicine, that it progresses in a linear, ordinary, uh, linear orderly way, um, that we have one treatment that replaces a different one because it's shown to be better. So a classic example in psychiatry would be clozapine for treatment-resistant schizophrenia, where a canonical paper by John Cain in 1998 showed that clozapine was more effective than continued first-generation antipsychotics at high doses. By 1999, it was showed in meta-analytic studies to have a robust evidence base, and this has become the standard of care for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. However, there's a darker way in which medical science progresses, and this is called medical reversal. 
This occurs when new studies that are better powered, controlled, or designed than their predecessors contradict current practice, leading to a return to the practice that existed before, but typically only after widespread adoption by physicians and a large number of patients being exposed to this practice. To, so to emphasize this distinction, in medical reversal, a medical practice falls out of favor, not because something came along that's better, but it turns out it didn't work in the first place. And this is only found out after large numbers of patients have been exposed to an ineffective therapy. There's limited research about how frequent medical reversal is in psychiatry, but there's a more robust literature base from general medicine. The most compelling research was a review of 360 articles published in the New England Journal that tested an existing medical practice against what, it, what existed before, what it replaced. The data were, were frightening. It found that 40% of the studies uh, of the, the practices were found to be reversals, meaning that they were worse or no better than what they than what existed before them. Another 22% were inconclusive, and only 38% upheld the practice, meaning that the new therapy was consistently better than what it replaced. These, the examples of reversal were core features of general medicine from every branch, practices that affected tens to hundreds of thousands of patients per year. Stents for stable coronary artery disease versus medical management, atenolol for hypertension, um, antiarrhythmics, hormone replacement therapy for cardiac outcomes, and a number of surgical procedures. What this research showed is that there's a common pathway that leads to, to practices being reversed, that is being shown to be ineffective only after widespread adoption. Typically what happens is that there's a new biological theory or treatment target that feels very intuitively correct. There ends up being a small positive trial or one that has maybe it's larger, but has method methodological limitations. These trials are positive. And because of this, they lead to widespread adoption, often in guidelines, um, where large numbers of patients are exposed. Eventually, but sometimes only after years or, or a decade, there's a discrepancy recognized between how many people are exposed to the treatment and just how small the literature base is supporting it. Eventually, a large randomized trial, high quality, large number of patients is conducted. And in the case of reversal, it's found to be negative. That shows that the treatment should never have been implemented so widely and wasn't better than what existed before. We then go back to what, what, uh, what was the previous treatment leading to the term medical reversal. I'd like to pick an example and I'll try to argue and convince you that prazosin for PTSD nightmares should be an example of medical reversal in psychiatry and that it actually follows many of the pathways for, treat, for the type of reversal seen in other branches of medicine. The story of prazosin is, is, is an interesting one. The, it came from preclinical data on typically veterans with PTSD and nightmares, which had some evidence of higher noradrenergic metabolites in CSF in small numbers of veterans, and other data suggesting that there may be a role for, for, um, for noradrenaline in PTSD, hyperarousal symptoms, and PTSD nightmares. Eventually, uh, prazosin as a centrally acting alpha-1 antagonist made a lot of intuitive sense for why it could be beneficial for these symptoms. Eventually, there were some case studies. And then in 2003, there was the first study by a group out of Puget Sound VA, um, which looked at 10 veterans in a crossover trial, um, evaluating prazosin. This was a positive study. And over the next 13 years or so, there were a series of trials, almost exclusively in men, almost exclusively in military populations, some also looking at comorbid alcohol use. And what I'll draw your attention to here over these studies are two features. One is that they were done principally by the same treatment, the same research group out of the Puget Sound VA. But the second is that these studies were very small, 10 patients in a crossover trial, 13 patients in a crossover trial, 30 patients, 60 patients. The single largest study is the one at the bottom with 96 patients that was actually looking at comorbid alcohol use and was actually negative on, on PTSD outcomes. By 2018 though, Based on this very small literature base involving about 330 subjects, with half of those randomized to placebo, principally from very small studies, over 150,000 veterans per year were being prescribed prazosin for PTSD. This represented one out of every four veterans who was taking medication for PTSD was taking prazosin. After a search, I couldn't find any data on rates in the general population, but my guess is that it's probably substantial as well. I cite the year 2018 because this is when there was, there was noted this discrepancy between just how many veterans were taking prazosin and realistically how small the literature base was supporting it. In 2018, a canonical paper out of the New England Journal was published looking at 
over 300 veterans. This is basically the same size as every study combined to date. And it was a negative trial, a high quality multi-center trial um, involving over 300 veterans looking at various outcomes on their primary measures, secondary measures at 10 weeks, 26 weeks, no benefit from prazosin over, over placebo. It should be noted there have been some critiques of these studies, but overall, it was a really robust, high quality study. The second largest study actually was just published earlier this year in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. This was looking at doxazosin, essentially a longer acting prazosin analog, looking at um, PTSD symptoms and comorbid alcohol use. Again, 140 subjects, the second largest study to date. And again, no benefit from, from prazosin on measures of PTSD outcomes, or in this case of alcohol use as well, um, uh, uh, which was the main outcome of the study. To, sum, to summarize this literature, this looks like the pathway of medical reversal, preclinical evidence providing a very intuitive understanding for why prazosin could be helpful, small studies having positive results, principally out of a single research group, large numbers of patients exposed to the medication, and eventual high-quality randomized control trials that were consistently negative, showing that prazosin didn't outperform placebo. This raises the question of, is prazosin for PTSD an outlier, or is this an example of reversal in psychiatry that might be more common than we would like to believe? I argue that psychiatry research um, has a number of features based on the, the medical literature of medical reversal that may make it at higher risk of having this type of reversal. For one, in the clinical trial methods, in psychiatry, we have larger numbers of small sample size trials compared to other branches of medicine, say cardiology. We principally have subjective or surrogate outcomes. We have limitations with blindings, strict inclusion and exclusion criteria that lead probably to poor generalizability and also a robust pharmaceutical influence. There are some guideline elements like increasing reliance on pragmatic and observational trials rather than traditional double-blinded high quality randomized trials or reliance on statistical rather than clinical significance to determine whether a medication is effective. Finally, I think there are a number of cl clinician factors, and even in my short time as a trainee, ones that resonate with me. It's challenging seeing uh, a patient who's in a crisis when we don't have a treatment with a robust literature to, to give. There's an urgency and a need to want to do something to be helpful, and when there is some literature base that's positive, there's a tendency to prescribe those. I would argue that it probably leads to widespread adoption on evidence that might not be as robust as we think. There's also an intuitive sense of psychopharmacology. We like theories that make sense, as in the case of prazosin with, with why an, an alpha-1 antagonist would be helpful. We also have high pl placebo response rates, which mean that even if something doesn't outperform placebo, in clinical practice, it might look effective and people might get better purely because we have high placebo response rates. If we look at examples, though, I think there are a number of places where we can start to see cases where, uh, where we have widespread practices that might be examples of reversal, because the highest quality literature date generally doesn't support their use in the way that it's traditionally done. I'll quickly go through these, but just to give a flavor of things that might, you know, that might raise this, this concern. SSRI doses above the FDA minimum in depression the highest quality meta-analytic evidence looking at trials that had two fixed dose arms found no benefit from any comparison. Um, SNRI doses above the FDA minimum in depression using the same trial methodology also found no benefit to higher doses, things that are done routinely. The highest quality evidence looking at increasing SSRI doses after initially there was non-response and a slightly different trial method it was a more limited meta-analysis, but the existing evidence to date is also negative, looking at increasing doses once there's been initial non-response with an SSRI. Alpha-2 antagonists combined with serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This was from a meta-analysis published last year, which was published as a positive finding. You can look at the SMD at the bottom, showing that it had a, a, a small to, to medium-sized effect. However, if you look at the three largest trials, which I highlighted in red, Every large trial was negative, and these were really quite large trials. The second two largest trials, which I highlight here, were also negative trials. When you look at everything that's left over, this does look like an effect that was principally driven by very small studies with large treatment effects that didn't replicate in high-quality larger studies. It's the same pattern that we see in medical reversal. This leads to the question, why does this matter? And I'll say that there are three reasons principally that stand out. The first is that patients may be harmed when we're given treatments that aren't effective. In the case of using high doses, or there are all sorts of examples from the general medicine literature where this, where this literature is more robust, 
that giving patients treatments that end up being no better than placebo and might have side effects risks harming patients, especially when they're widely implemented. The second is that medical reversal causes distrust of medicine or medical progress. I'm sure many of us have had the experience of recommending a medication that we feel will be effective and in a patient's best interest with a strong evidence base, and a patient brings up concerns that they've read online about whether clinical trial studies are accurate. The picture I have here is from, um, uh, from insulin coma therapy, and this is just to allude to the fact that I think psychiatry, more than other fields, should be cautious about the stigma of older trials and the way that it sticks with the field, even when it's dramatically improved in terms of the evidence base. The final reason I think that this is especially relevant is we've had a lot of thera new therapeutics coming to market with variable quality of the evidence. There's a lot of hype, a lot of advertising. I, I picked up many here just from online. And I think it raises caution about how thoughtful we should be before adopting or widely prescribing therapies and really demanding a high quality evidence, especially when there are a lot of pressures to, to widely prescribe something. This all leads to, to, I think, the sense, what can we do as clinicians to try to reduce the risk of reversal in psychiatry? I hope that some of these are intuitive based on the talks, and it really is quite simple. It principally is demanding high quality evidence, large sample size, widely generalizable, double-blinded, um, randomized trials with good quality evidence before we widely implement practice, depending on how many people are affected. And the more people that are affected, the more cautious we should be in demanding high quality evidence before widely adopting it. The point number two is to be cautious about having intuitive biological explanations for treatment as the reason we prescribe them. The way we know treatments work is based on clinical trial evidence, not because there is a really compelling biological theory, even when it can be very intuitive and makes a lot of sense from preclinical data. The third point is that I, I hope that we can reevaluate our use of existing practices and look at how good the quality of evidence is supporting them and be open-minded about potentially changing or reevaluating what we do if we feel that there's not a robust literature. The final point, which, which is relevant to Prazosin, is that I, I hope that we can become maybe a bit more aggressive about reducing the use of practices when there is negative evidence. It's been surprising to see that even with multiple negative large quality trials with Prazosin, I get the sense that, and there's, there's no data since 2018, unfortunately, but I don't get the sense that it's been dramatically scaled back in its use ever since those negative trials came out. So this is everything I'd like just to make a few acknowledgements. A lot of this research was done by Vinay Prasad and Adam Sifu, um, and just some people who have been really good mentors to me, but these are my own uh, views. I think that's it for the presentation. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and for the, the next introduction, I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Katie Unger. Hi, everyone. I am pleased today to introduce Dr. Jennifer Gandhi. Um, Dr. Gandhi is a fourth year psychiatry resident at the UCLA Simmel Institute for Neuroscience, uh, where she currently serves as the chief resident of the Women's Life Clinic. Uh, Dr. Gandhi graduated with a BA in philosophy and political economy from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she twice received the Outstanding Economic Student Award. She then attended the University of Chicago, where she completed her MD at the Pritzker School of Medicine and her PhD at the Harris School of Public Policy. For her PhD, she studied the rural-urban divide in the geographic distribution of the physician workforce and was awarded the T32 National Research Service Award for this research. Dr. Gandhi's main clinical interests are women's mental health and reproductive psychiatry. During her residency, she co-chaired the Women in Psychiatry Interest Group. As chief resident of the Women's Life Clinic, she's given multiple talks on reproductive psychiatry and has participated in advocacy events, speaking, of, sorry, speaking about reproductive health, rights, and justice post Roe v. Wade. After graduation, Dr. Gandhi will be continuing her studies as she completes a fellowship at the UCLA Counseling and Psychological Services in College Mental Health and Transitional Age Youth. Please take it away, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you for that introduction. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the psychological impact of obstetric violence. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, by the end of this presentation, I would like for you to be able to define obstetric violence and identify examples of it, understand the relationship between obstetric violence and childbirth-related post-traumatic stress disorder, 
and identify at least one way to help patients who have experienced obstetric violence or birth trauma. I want to start out uh, with a depiction of this phenomenon from television. Um, I'm about to show a clip from the show Fleischman is in Trouble, which is based on a novel by Taffy Brodesser Ackner in 2019. Just a warning before I begin that this clip contains some strong language and the content could be disturbing. Hello in there. We heard you were here. Get them away. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey, come with me. Yeah. Um, did you hear from Dr. Goldberg? I told you I'm covering. I've done this at least uh, five or six times before. I, um, <clears throat> my husband is, is, um, um, do you think maybe we should stop the induction? Because my, my blood pressure is, is lower now. I, I'm not progressing. I'm exhausted from the state all. Uh, it made me hallucinate all night last night, but I didn't want the epidural yet. Let's just see what's going on in there. And then if you're still not progressing, we'll talk. Ow! 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 Is this, is this just supposed to be... Ow! This is not an exam. There is some leak here. Ow! Give me the food. What is he doing? What are you doing? So we'll talk about the clip in a moment, but first, what is obstetric violence? It's harm inflicted by healthcare providers or a healthcare system on a person during pregnancy, childbirth, or in the postpartum. And there are several categories to include violations across countries and cultures over time. This definition comes from Bowser and Hill's categories of disrespect and abuse. And um, I'll just let you take a moment to review the slide. In the clip that we just saw, the physician sweeps Rachel's membranes without her consent, refuses to explain the situation when she asks what he's doing, and continues to perform the procedure even after she asks him to stop. I think that these violations fall into the first two categories of physical abuse and non-consensual care, but you can see that there are many forms that obstetric violence can take. There's a long history of violence against women in obstetrics and gynecology that has roots in racism and sexism. And this is a depiction of just one example here. Uh, James Marion Sims, who's shown on the right, um, is known as the father of gynecology. And he experimented on black women without their consent, testing the use of the speculum, as well as performing surgeries on enslaved black women without pain relief. The term obstetric violence reaches as far back as the time of James Marion Sims. It was first used by Dr. James Blundell in a lecture published in The Lancet in 1827, where he criticized the approach of using medicalized interventions in childbirth to violently interfere in the birthing process. Uh, more recently, there's been a resurgence of the term since the 2000s. It's much more common than you might imagine. In one study of over 2,100 women who gave birth in the US between 2010 and 2016, 17% re reported at least some type of mistreatment. And you can see the different categories here on the right um, with some women reporting multiple types of mistreatment. The most common violations are being shouted at or scolded by healthcare providers um, or requests and concerns being ignored by providers. In the same study, rates of obstetric violence vary by place of birth, socioeconomic status, and the risk level of pregnancy, as well as race and ethnicity. Rates were higher in hospital births, in people with lower SES, and in higher risk pregnancies. And rates for Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, and Asian women ranged from 21 to 33%, whereas rates for white respondents were 14%. I started off with a fictional depiction of obstetric violence, but I also wanted to tell the real story of Kimberly Turbin, 
a Los Angeles woman who in 2013 gave birth to a baby boy. This is the headline from an article published in Quartz in 2018 about her case. When she first became pregnant, she was attending college and preparing for a career as a dental hygienist, and she was even training to run her first marathon. As a two-time rape survivor, when she went in to actually deliver her baby, she asked the staff at Providence Tarzana to be mindful of her history. Her OB, whom she'd just met once a couple of weeks prior to delivery, performed an episiotomy on her against her will. He cut her perineum 12 times despite her refusals. And the, encount uh, the encounter was caught on video that her mother took of the entire birth. Uh, Turbin experienced emotional and physical trauma in the months after her son's birth. She was in pain. She found it difficult to even sit down. She had to completely change her diet because her bowel movements were painful and these symptoms continued for over four years. She further found it difficult to get other healthcare providers to take her seriously regarding the impact of her episiotomy and her subsequent vaginal pain. One doctor gave her lubricant and told her to try anal sex in response to her complaints. These are her own words of the psychological toll of this experience. The unwanted episiotomy built on a history of sexual assault and reinforced a protectiveness over her body that came from fear. So birth trauma is when a birthing person, uh, a partner or a witness believes that the, the birthing person's life or the baby's life is in danger. And post-traumatic stress disorder that develops in response to a birth trauma is childbirth related PTSD, and it's common. In one study, uh, six to 8% of women had cardinal symptoms of PTSD, including intrusive thoughts and avoidance behaviors following birth. And that study found that having a sense of control during the birth process can mitigate some of the symptoms. Other studies have suggested that the rates of PTSD are between two and 6% um, in women, even when the baby is born healthy at full term. And the rates can be as high as 25% in people who experience significant maternal morbidity. So obstetric violence can lead to PTSD. Um, research has shown that when women experience maltreatment, they're more likely to report symptoms of PTSD. And this has impacts on the physical and emotional well-being of the mother and her experience of motherhood. This can in turn have impacts on the mother's ability to bond with her baby, even when the baby is quote unquote healthy and can lead to worse outcomes in the child, including delayed intellectual development and mental illness. As we saw earlier in the clip from Fleischman, Rachel feels out of control in the situation and the birth experience is taken away from her. And we don't see it in the clip, but in the context of the series, we understand that this later impacts her ability to parent her children. So what can we do? Um, I think part of the goal of this talk for me was to raise awareness of this issue to people who are unfamiliar with it so that we can be more mindful when speaking with our patients. I think the first step is in asking patients about their birth experience. And this can start with an open-ended question, like what was your childbirth experience like and how did it go for you? And then if indicated, it can move on to more targeted questions, like did anything happen that you felt shouldn't have? Starting a question, um, uh, starting a conversation about it can open the door for people to tell their stories. And it can also help repair the loss of trust in a system that has abused them. Second, consider a, a diagnosis of childbirth-related PTSD in women who have experienced a traumatic uh, childbirth or experienced uh, obstetric violence. Right now in the DSM-5, there is no specifier for childbirth-related PTSD, but people with that kind of PTSD exhibit symptoms in the same categories of intrusions, avoidance, negative alterations in cognitions, mood, and arousal that we know to be true in um, other forms of PTSD. Third, if a patient is diagnosed with PTSD, um, know that there are treatments available. Specifically, there's several therapies, including the trauma resiliency model, prolonged exposure, and EMDR that are validated treatments for PTSD. And sometimes support groups can also be helpful. And finally, I think we can help teach our colleagues in obstetrics and gynecology about these issues. 
Research shows that control or perception of control can mitigate the development of long-term impacts from this kind of violence and trauma. And by implementing trauma-informed care, we can help mitigate those traumatic experiences for people during such a vulnerable times like childbirth. Um, I really don't think that this is an issue specific to specific providers or a few bad apples, but rather a structural problem that requires us as healthcare providers to be a part of the solution. I think this is a tough topic to, to think about. And when I was researching it, the data could be very disheartening, but there is hope for prevention and treatment. And I think that's where um, we as psychiatrists, therapists, and members of the public can come in. I would just like to thank several people who um, were uh, instrumental in this, in this um, presentation um, and gave talks on adjacent topics that I've recently um, heard and learned a lot from. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to uh, kind of express my appreciation and my gratitude to all three of our speakers today, um, Angie, Kevin, Jen. Um, it, it does take a lot to kind of get up here in front of a large audience, even a virtual audience <laughs> can, be, can be challenging in its own ways. Um, and I think each of you kind of brought something that um, everyone can take with them, something to, to perhaps view differently next time you're treating a patient who has issues with insomnia. Um, the next time that you're considering making a treatment recommendation, maybe you might look at the generally evidence more closely, or next time you're working with um, somebody who's given birth recently or might be a victim of obstetric violence, I think there's something um, that each of us can kind of take with us and apply to our own practice. Um, so we did have some questions that, that have rolled in, and um, if anybody has other questions, feel free to, to put that into the Q&A. Um, the first question that we have is for, um, this one is for um, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Um, and basically asking about the potential effects of societal factors as well in terms of insomnia. Like, do you think that there's any effect with perhaps like a lot of screen time with people having their phones on them or with um, the recent um, the recent pandemic, um, whether we are essentially creating a generation of people who are struggling with insomnia? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think absolutely, yes. Uh, the past few years, I think uh, we can all agree that COVID has brought a lot of different changes, uh, especially that we've seen clinically as psychiatrists and disturbed sleep is definitely one of them. Uh, sleep hygiene practices and all of the, the things I kind of mentioned um, during the talk are definitely um, things that are a little bit harder to maintain now that there's, for a lot of people working from home or not as, um, not really having a separate time from being home and going to work. and. Um, can definitely affect those things. Uh, what's interesting, I think, um, like on the other hand, now that we are probably using phones more and there's more screen time, um, there was also a study that was done showing that web-based CBTI is also um, as effective as face-to-face -face CBTI. So mm -hmm. it's possible that uh, even though there have been negatives that we could also view it in a positive light, that people could also um, have more access to to uh, CBTI that way now that we've um, had a study that just came out actually like last year. So potentially um, another avenue that um, is a potentially a benefit from, from everything that's happened. Yeah, and yeah, maybe all the screen time might not be entirely bad if there's other ways to kind of get people to have better sleep through that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, next question is for Dr. Kennedy. Um, question here is basically kind of cutting to the heart of like how we, approach our own personal clinical experience with what the data can sometimes show us. And um, so this person was asking with their experience with Prazis and um, technology perhaps in the setting of a small N, um, they've noticed clinical efficacy. So they're asking, is this essentially just SIBO for themselves as a, a treating physician? How would you kind of guide somebody in, in reconciling that difference between the perception and what the data shows? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I mean, I think the reality is that placebo response rates are, are high in psychiatry as high as 80% of the overall treatment effect in the case of antidepressants for, for depression. So, so there's a lot of it there, and there are a lot of factors in the clinical relationship, the natural history of a disorder that can make large efficacy seem like it's related to a medication that might be due to non-specific medication factors. Yeah. The only way that we can really tell that definitively is, is in a clinical trial environment. Otherwise, it's too hard to control for all of those factors. So we have a small, we have limited tools to try to tease apart what really is going on. 
Um, but I think, at least in this case, the evidence would suggest that that for things like nightmares and PTSDs or some of these symptoms, that there is a large placebo response element to it. And it may be what, you know, some of what we're seeing along with the components of the placebo response, the natural history relationship with the provider, um, other stressors diminishing, things of that nature. Thank you. Yeah, really, really kind of a lot to grapple with, but definitely a good perspective to take even in our day-to-day -day clinical work. Um, I have a question for Dr. Gandhi. Um, I think this particular topic is one that really kind of crosses the line between psychiatry in terms of kind of a stress or a traumatic response, as well as ob I think naturally. Um, is there a lot of work um, that's being done kind of cross-disciplinarily um, between ob and psychiatry on this, or is this something that's being led more by one or the other? I think there is some. Um, I think that um, just with as with anything that can be cross-disciplinary, um, there can be silos um, in the literature. Um, but in my research, I found some on both sides. I think it is more on the psychiatry side. There's also an aspect of it that I didn't get a chance to talk about, which is the legal aspect of it and what legal repercussions there are. And there's a lot of work being done on that um, end of it too, um, particularly mm. in the Kimberly Turbin case that I spoke about. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely kind of brings multiple different fields, even outside of medicine together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question for Dr. Radhakrishnan. Um, in your own work, in terms of recommending or trying to implement CBTI for patients, um, how would you respond to somebody who is basically saying like, oh, I would prefer to just take a pill. I, um, I don't really want to kind of engage in CBT. Um, are, are there particular strategies that you might employ there? Or would you just say, oh, that's fine. This is kind of your choice. Do you have us any thought of that? Sure. So when that conversation comes up, I think uh, it's definitely, I think about the severity and uh, if a uh, medication would be clinically necessary at that point and about the deterioration and functioning as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I would also present the evidence for CBTI. I would mention how with medications, I think it's that the data shows that perhaps it, um, people are able to fall asleep about 10 minutes earlier than, um, than without medications. So overall, the long-term data for medications is not nearly as strong. Mm -hmm. um, so I would bring up those um, factors. I would bring up the, um, the dependence on medications. And um, I would, yeah, basically, if I'm able to do a brief uh, intervention with the patient, then I'll frequently just kind of go through some of the CBTI principles um, mm -hmm. and suggest starting with that and then um, to reach out to me and see how those things work uh, for the patient rather than starting the medication. Um, or if I do the medication, um, then also like planning for a short and just kind of setting the, the expectation uh, right at the beginning that if we do try a medication, um, we we would want to simultaneously uh, do a referral for CBTI and try to taper off the medication um, as possible. Thank you, very helpful. Um, for Dr. Kennedy, um, there's a question that came in about how we reconcile subpopulation differences um, that may not be seen in a large double-blind randomized controlled trial or meta-analysis of those. Um, are, do you have any thoughts on whether there might be like specific populations with that might get obscured in a larger meta-analysis or RC, RTC? Yeah, the, this is a great question. I think it's been really the, the million-dollar question in the case of prazosin and, and, and PTSD. The commentary on the New England paper was actually called Alpha Adrenergic Receptors in PTSD, Failure or Time for Precision Medicine, getting at this question. And in this case, it was built around the theory of is there a sub? It, is the reason the study failed because it prazosin really only works in a subtype, which are veterans who have this elevated noradrenergic tone measured either in increased, you know, uh, people who are hypertensive at baseline or or have other markers of this. I, I think the 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 thing that I struggle with, and I think it's a question I struggle with personally a lot, is that there's always I think a temptation in in clinical trials that when there's a negative a negative study to search for a subpopulation, there are all sorts of ways to p-hack and find subpopulations on secondary outcomes that are positive. And I think the reality should be, again, I'm very conservative about this, but demanding a high enough quality of evidence, which is if people are convinced that there is a specific subtype that a medication is effective in, it should be the primary pre-specified outcome. And it, we should be testing it specifically in that population rather than trying to look at larger populations. And when it's negative, suggest, 
oh, well, it's, it's because it only works in a subpopulation. Sometimes it looks like, I, I think, clinical trials wanting to have it both ways. Thank you. Um, question for Dr. Gandhi. Um, I think in clinical practice, we're probably most likely to screen for obstetric violence um, in people that we know have like recently given birth or have young children at home. Um, do you think it's worthwhile to also screen for obstetric violence in um, like an older adult, somebody who is perhaps not quite as proximal to um, the possibility of being a victim of um, obstetric violence? Um, and if so, like what sort of um, things would you bring up with them to, to um, kind of help them process that? Yeah, I mean, I think it can be because, you know, when we first do our initial evaluation in most patients, we are talking about their life history. There is limited time. And so there's, you know, um, there's thought that should be given to like how many of these screening questions that you do. But I, I think that for many um, people who have had a childbirth experience in their past, it is worth asking one of those quick opening questions of, you know, open-ended questions um, and then um, seeing where it goes. And if it, if, if it seems like there is more to be asked than, than considering it, because what I found in my research is that the, while the, the short-term impacts can be very dramatic um, in that postpartum period, the impacts can be lifelong, which we know from PTSD um, in general, uh, even if the trauma occurred in childhood, it can still impact someone's life um, many years down the line if it's not addressed or treated. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that makes sense, absolutely. Right. Um, for Dr. Radhakrishnan, we had a, a question um, asking about consumer sleep tracking devices like the Apple Watch or the Aura Ring. Um, are these um, potentially helpful, like allies in, in CBTI, or is it something that does, isn't really compatible with them? I would say yes. I think it personally, I think it's something that could definitely be helpful. A big challenge that I've noticed for my other CBT patients is remembering to do the homework. So remembering to maybe keep a sleep diary or uh, log your sleep schedule is definitely a challenge. Um, I, I don't know if many people who still write things down on paper. I know a lot of people have notes on their phones or um, have ways of keeping information uh, stored digitally. So in that way, um, if as long as it's uh, helping people to be more consistent and able to keep up with uh, those assignments, I think the I've heard especially the Aura Ring has uh, some pretty good features in terms of sleep tracking mm -hmm. uh, and the Apple Watch as well, uh, just in terms of having some baseline data. So I would say, yes, it's potentially a good uh, ally for CBTI as well. Okay. Are, are there any potential situations where somebody could like overly fixate on it? Like I know part of what you presented was um, like, breaking that association between like, I didn't get enough sleep, I'm gonna have a terrible day. <laughs> like, are, are there situations you've encountered where people might get overly fixated? Yeah, absolutely. I think that can that can definitely happen as well. And I've heard that from patients like, oh, I am, my Apple Watch says I only got this much sleep last night. And mm -hmm. um, and that becomes a concern as well. Uh, but I think then along with um, CBTI, like in conjunction, the cognitive restructuring piece can, can um, help with that. And as I said, CBTI is also pretty modifiable. So as things come up, those would be things that could be discussed and um, kind of restructured as well. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Um, a question for Dr. Kennedy, um, asking specifically about the long latency time that sometimes occurs between when evidence-based treatments are developed in the lab and when they're available to patients, um, and asking about the implications of what you presented in terms of medical reversal um, for this challenge. Should there be any sort of guidelines or parameters uh, for people kind of working in this translational space, taking things from um, initial development to actual patient care? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that's one that's really challenging, especially when we're seeing patients who have, you know, who are facing difficulties and urgent issues or crises that we don't have perfect evidence for. There really is this question of what we should do. And I certainly err, I think, you know, far on the conservative side. And one of the reasons for that is that I think we run into this problem very frequently when we start to adopt trials or start to widely implement trials based on relatively poor evidence. And then it becomes the standard of care. And it, tie, and it tied into, I think, other questions that I've seen asked about this, this topic. Once something becomes the standard of care, it's then really hard to study it in effective clinical trials because we run into all of these issues of who are the people enrolling in clinical trials when they can get 
when something is widely prescribed? Are they different in some way? And then it raises questions when there are high quality negative trials about how, how they should be interpreted. I, I think I err strongly on the side that we really upfront before things become widely implemented should have a pretty robust, robust kind of research base for this. I think the other related reason is there's really no incentive for either pharmaceutical companies or even for the NIMH to try to run better quality studies when in general we adopt things with poor quality evidence. It would only be, I think, a negative incentive for a pharmaceutical company to run more trials that are more generalizable or higher quality when people are already prescribing something widely based on much smaller trials. They could only, only have negative evidence. I'm not sure without, I think there, there's a fantastic book called Evident, um, called Ending Medical Reversal um, by Prasad and Sifu about this topic. And they, they're, they're both, one is a hematologist, one is uh, an internist, but they have a number of strategies of what they think should be done. A number of things include trying to enroll, just make ease the burden of enrolling people in clinical trials when there is clinical equipoise. They talk about things in hospitals that it should be easier when there are trivial differences let's try to get more people randomized. Let's try to ease the burden of getting people into clinical trials so we have clear data. And I think I err on that side that we probably have too few clinical trials for important questions because we're afraid of harming patients who are in clinical trials. And then the result is that we probably harm patients who aren't in clinical trials because we don't have good data. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful perspective. And um, I am sorry to say that we are almost to the hour. So I, I don't think we'll have time for any more questions. I, I know there were a few more that came in um, so I think these were all just very kind of thought-provoking questions and um, certainly worth more discussion. Um, so just one more time, I did want to say thank you to the to the three of you for um, bringing us these topics and for being able, willing to answer some questions about them. And to say thank you to all of you in the audience for, for joining us this morning. Have a good rest of your day, okay? <laughs>